very good evening to all the viewers who have joined for this uh, wonderful session of rheumatology test and discussion we have already covered all the topics in the rheumatology and this test and discussion will be covering all the minor topics as well as it will be uh, acting as a rapid revision on the topics discussed so far thank you for joining uh, with us today and i welcome dr rashmi ma'am with us today who, who is jo joining with us for this wonderful discussion thank you so much ma'am for joining among mm. your busy schedule now i hand over the session to you ma'am thank you so much dr raghu so this as he has told this will be covering a few of the minor topics that we have not touched in the already discussed topics uh, in the form of a question and answer so that you will be able, able you will be able to easily you know assimilate the points like i told you rheumatology is majorly rheumatology basically mcqs also is basically about identifying the key points in the question which will help you diagnosing the condition and thereby answering the question so these key points are very very important and i have highlighted that throughout all the chapters that we have discussed so this will also be similar to that i'll tell you what are the key points that you must remember for each and every disease okay so let's start the first question a 40 year old female presented to the emergency room with shortness of breath dry cough and fatigue she complains of painful swollen joints and red eyes sometimes she has a history of nephrolithiasis on examination she has tender axillary lymph nodes and tender patches on her skin chest radiograph shows infiltrate biopsy reveals non cacheating granulomas which of the following is the most likely diagnosis so is it sle chuck straws or egpa polyarteritis nodosa tuberculosis or sarcoidosis so one thing that you can rule out is tuberculosis so i would like all of you to uh, type in your answers in the chat box so that we can have a discussion instead of a one way teaching after all this is a test and discussion so i would like all of you to interact better okay so something that we can rule out here is tuberculosis why because this patient is having non cacheating granulomas we know that tuberculosis has cacheating granulomas so that we are ruling out so next systemic lupus erythematosus what do you think so the patient the patient is having painful swollen joints and sometimes red eyes she is having difficulty in breathing dry cough fatigue all these are very non specific symptoms right and can fit into systemic lupus erythematosus also but you need to remember there is something nephrolithiasis which we have not seen in the other discussion topics like earlier we have not seen anything about nephrolithiasis as a presentation in the rheumatological topics right so nephrolithiasis tender axillary lymph nodes right and tender patches on her skin what does all this mean tender axillary lymph nodes tender patches on the skin right in chuck straws what have we seen we have seen that there should be eosinophilia there should be granulomatosis and vasculitis right eosinophilia asthma all these things should be there so there is no history to suggest any any anything like eosinophilia or asthma in this question so we will watch chuck straws also right if it was systemic lupus erythematosus the patches would no patches on the skin would not be tender right so they are painless you know maculopapular rashes isn't it so the rashes will not be tender so this is not systemic lupus erythematosus also so moving on to polyarteritis nodosa what was the thing that i had told you about polyarteritis nodosa the biopsy will be showing micro aneurysms micro aneurysms right that is a key point for my polyarteritis nodosa so but that is also not found in this question so this also we can rule out so what is the answer we now come down to sarcoidosis right sarcoidosis we have not discussed earlier i will tell you some salient points regarding sarcoidosis now can you tell me why sarcoidosis patients have nephrolithiasis can you tell me that right can you just try attempting i'll tell you subsequently but i would like all of you to attempt why sarcoidosis patients can have nephrolithiasis it is not presenting always but sometimes sarcoidosis patients do have nephrolithiasis can you tell me yeah you can type into the chat box in the meantime okay so let's talk about sarcoidosis sarcoidosis is basically a granulomatous disease right it is a granulomatous disease it is more common among the females than the males it is more common among the females than the males like other rheumatological diseases it is a multi system disease multi system disease right it can affect the lungs it can affect the lymph nodes it can affect the skin it can affect the kidneys it can affect the eyes all the systems can be affected 
right so sarcoidosis this is an what granuloma like we saw in the question non caseating granuloma right non caseating granuloma caseating granuloma is seen in tuberculosis non caseating granuloma one of the differential diagnosis is sarcoidosis right so what does this do what are the cells which are involved in this cd4 positive t cells are involved in this pathology okay cd4 positive t cells are involved in this there is lot of macrophages involvement there is involvement of lot of macrophages because of which the granulomas are produced okay the epithelial cells and the granulomas are produced because of the involvement of the macrophages right so sarcoidosis is a multi system disease it is a granulomatous disease it is more predominant among the females than the males cd4 positive t cells are involved in the pathogenesis it also involves macrophages which are involved in the granuloma formation right so next move on these granulomas what do they do these granulomas produce vitamin d right vitamin d these granulomas produce vitamin d because of it which what happens Hyper, hypercalcemia is there because of this vitamin d production excess vitamin b vitamin d production by the granulomas what happens vitamin d production is there and this leads on to hypercalcemia so when there is hypercalcemia obviously the patient will have calcium stones right so that explains nephrolithiasis in this patient in this particular patient okay there will be other manifestations of hypercalcemia also like moans groans bony pain all those things will be there because of hyper hypercalcemia but one of the manifestation like we have seen in this question is nephrolithiasis right so now we have answered that point so what do we see what why do we have the red eyes red eyes are because of uveitis right red eyes are because of uveitis so there is some syndrome there are two syndromes which are actually involved uh, associated with this so first one we'll see is lofgren syndrome you need to remember these names these are often asked in mcqs Lofgren's syndrome, right? What does this consist of? This consists of arthritis, right? First one is arthritis. Second one is erythema nodosum, right? Second feature will be erythema nodosum, right? In this patient also we have seen this arthritis, erythema nodosum. The third one will be bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, hilar lymphadenopathy. with or without the fourth one will be anterior uveitis right anterior uveitis so what is the lofgren syndrome having it is having four components like in this patient we have seen that the patient is having axillary lymph nodes but the patient could also have hilar lymph nodes right tender patches on the skin which is erythema nodosum red eyes are there which is uveitis then painful swollen joints arthritis so this patient is probably having sarcoidosis with lofgren syndrome right so there is one more syndrome what is it called heat furt syndrome right heat heat furt heat furt waldenstrom syndrome heat furt waldenstrom syndrome right so what is this heat furt waldenstrom syndrome this is uveo parotitis it's also called uveo parotitis right what happens in this uveo parotitis uveitis parotitis what happens you have uveitis you have parotid fever also parotitis also you have uveitis as well as parotitis you have uveitis as well as parotitis and along with that you also have a seventh cranial nerve palsy uveitis plus parotitis plus seventh cranial nerve palsy so it's also called uveo parotitis or seventh cranial nerve along with seventh cranial nerve palsy right so these acute skin conditions are erythema nodosum the chronic skin lesions what are they called when the acute tender lesions are called erythema nodosum when it becomes chronic chronic what is it called it is called lupus perneo right it is called lupus perneo what are these what color are these these are violaceous macular papular lesions these are violet in color right violet color macular papular lesions especially where are they they are seen in the malar area of the face okay malar area of the face and the bridge of the nose also okay it is similar to a sla lesion but it is a chronic sarcoidosis lesion okay so what is this this is called lupus perneo which is a chronic skin lesion the acute skin lesion is what is it erythema nodosum right it is erythema nodosum right let's move on
So let me show you the picture. So this is what I was talking about. This is called lupus pernio, right? This is lupus pernio. This is a violaceous macula papular rash, which is there in the malar area of the face and also bridge of the nose, right? This is a chronic lesion. Okay, so these patients can have renal involvement also. We can have granulomas in the kidney, right? Granulomatous nephritis can be there in the kidney. Okay, next let's move on. What are the markers that you must remember? In the question, if there is a sarcoidosis question, most probably they would have given you something about an ACE level. So what is this ACE level? Angiotensin converting enzyme level. When these levels are elevated, you the possibility of sarcoidosis is increased, right? So increased elevated ACE level, angiotensin converting enzyme level, right? So in these patients, what is the treatment? What is the treatment? Steroids, right? What is the treatment? The treatment are steroids, right? Okay. So in SLE, what will you have? You will have lupus, uh, painful joints with a lupus rash, which is non-tender, non-tender. Okay. So I hope you are now clear with how we have eliminated the other options and come to the diagnosis of sarcoid, even though you didn't know anything about sarcoid, right? So this is what you should be doing in applying yourself to the question. Okay. So I hope sarcoidosis is clear in this point. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. A primary gravida presented to the ER with preterm labor at 32 weeks of gestation. She has a history of systemic lupus erythematosus and was taking medication. Which of the following is true about treatment of SLE in pregnancy? Right? Steroids should be discontinued because they are teratogenic. Cyclophosphamide should be continued, discontinued because it is teratogenic. Methotrexate can be given during the first trimester but not during the second or third trimesters. Patients with SLE treated with high dose steroids should breastfeed their baby. Steroids have higher teratogenicity than methotrexate. Right? Can you tell me what the answer is among the five options which is true about which is true about the treatment of SLE in pregnancy? Can any of you tell me which of the following is true about the treatment of SLE in pregnancy? Right? So all of us know that steroids are given for different conditions during pregnancy and it is one of the safe drugs which can be used in pregnancy. Apart from that, there is one more drug which I have told you while reading about uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I think, which is safe during pregnancy. That is azathioprine. Right? See, steroids and azathioprine among the disease modifying agents are comparatively safer during pregnancy. Right. So, this say steroids can be used during pregnancy because they are uh, not teratogenic. Right. So, steroids should be discontinued because they are ter teratogenic. That is wrong. We all know that methotrexate is a teratogenic drug. Right. So, steroids don't have a higher teratogenicity than methotrexate. So, this option is also wrong. So, now we are left with three options. Cyclophosphamide should be discontinued. Met methotrexate can be given during the first and second trimester, first trimester, but not during the second or third trimesters. Patients with SLE are treated with high dose steroids should best treat their baby. Okay. Yes. So, what is the answer? So, in this, you can see that methotrexate cannot be given during the first trimester. It is contraindicated in the first trimester. Right? It is contraindicated in the first trimester. Why? Because it can cause craniofacial defects. Craniofacial defects. It can cause craniofacial defects and limb defects. It can also cause limb defects and hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. So, all these development happens in the first trimester itself. So, it is not advisable to put the patient on methotrexate in the first trimester or the second trimester or the third trimester. It is complete. It's better to be avoided. Right? It is better to be avoided. Right. Patients with SLE should be treated with high doses steroids should be should breastfeed their baby. The patients can breastfeed their baby. Steroids and cyclosporin are not a contraindication. But methotrexate and cyclophosphamide, it is definitely contraindicated in breastfeeding. But which is the most appropriate answer for this question? Which is the most appropriate answer for this question? Right? Can you give me a second, please? One second.
Right. Sorry for the disturbance. So, what is the most appropriate question, answer for this question? Cyclophosphamide is also teratogenic, right? So, that can also be discontinued. So, patients with treated with SLE can breastfeed their baby, right? Patients treated with SLE can actually breastfeed their baby. Which, which are the drugs which are contraindicated in breastfeeding? It is mainly methotrexid and cyclophosphamide, right? Yes. So, moving on to the third question. A 45-year-old male presents to the ER with weight loss, sudden loss of appetite, abdominal pain, excessive fatigue and joint pains. He also complains about lumps on the skin as well. His blood pressure was 170 by 100 millimeters mercury, pulse was 87 per minute and temperature is normal with normal respiratory rate. Laboratory tests reveal elevated creatinine 2.2 mg per deciliter, raised DSR, C and CAN, P and CAN negative. Arteriography shows microneurisms of the renal arteries. Which of the following is the treatment in this patient? Right? This is a straightforward question. I have given you the clue word also in the question. So, I would like all of you to identify what the disease is first. So, we we'll let us repeat the key points again. We have weight loss, sudden loss of appetite, abdominal pain, excessive fatigue, joint pains. There are lumps on the skin. Right? BP is around, BP is elevated. Renal involvement is there. So, the creatinine is elevated. The ESR is elevated. And there are microaneurysms of the renal arteries. So, microaneurysms of the renal arteries, what do you understand? It is polyarteritis nodosa. It is polyarteritis nodosa. Right? Yes, Dr. Kartika and Dr. Aradhya, you are very right. It is polyarteritis. Polyarteritis nodosa. It is not polyarthritis. It is polyarteritis nodosa. It is involvement of the arteries, inflammation of the arteries. So, it is polyarteritis nodosa. Right. Something we saw about when we were discussing about in about polyarteritis nodosa in our classes, I said that it is steroid refractory. Right. It is mostly having a poor prognosis because it is steroid refractory. But there are not many drugs which can be given along with this. So for this patient, what will you give? You need to give steroids plus cyclophosphamide. That is the ideal treatment. But anyway, these patients have a poor prognosis. So, steroids plus cyclophosphamide is the treatment, but it, but we are not, we don't have any big response with that. In such cases, when it is steroid resistant, what do you give for these patients? We need to give IVIG. When there is steroid resistance, right? When there is steroid resistance, you need to give IVIG. So, initially, you try treating with steroids and cyclophosphamide. If a patient becomes steroid resistant, then you need to give the patient IVIG. Like we all know, polyarteritis nodosa has a bad prognosis, mainly because it is steroid refractory. It is not responding immediately to steroids. In such cases, when there is no uh, improvement, you need to give cyclophosphamide. You can also add IVIG in cases of steroid resistance. Right? I am very happy all of you have recognized that my, about microaneurysms, which, uh, which is about polyarteritis nodosa. I am very happy about that. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. A 50-year-old female presents to the ER with dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea, red painful eyes. She complains of chronic dull pain in the gluteal region for the last 5 years and stiffness in the lower back that wakes up wakes her up in the morning. X-ray spine reveals squaring of vertebrae with bone spur formation. On MRI, sacroiliatus is seen. Which of the following is the most likely cardiac involvement in this patient? Right? Which of the following is the most likely cardiac involvement in this patient? Is it mitral stenosis? Is it mitral regurgitation? Is it aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation or pulmonary stenosis? This is something that we have already discussed. So, I would be happy if any of you can answer this. So, 50-year-old female has dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, red painful eyes. So, in rheumatology, when it is about red painful eyes, it can be two things. Either it is keratitis or uveitis. Most commonly, it, it is uveitis. In certain conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, you can have a scleritis, episcleritis, right? Then it can be about uh, scleritis. But most commonly, it is about uveitis, anterior uveitis, right? Anterior uveitis, she complains of chronic dull pain in the gluteal region, which signifies the sacroiliac region and also stiffness in the lower back. So, what is the... Yes, Dr. Ragu, it's very correct. Spondyloarthritis, especially... Uh, ankylosing spondylitis, right? Ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is the diagnosis for this patient. So, in patients with ankylosing spondylitis, spondyl spondylosis, what is the most common cardiac involvement that we have seen? 
what is the most common cardiac involvement is it mitral stenosis mitral regurgitation aortic stenosis aortic regurgitation or pulmonary stenosis what is the answer dr kartika it is not mitral stenosis it is aortic regurgitation right it is aortic regurgitation aortic regurgitation is the most common cardiac involvement dr kartika please note it is aortic regurgitation and not mitral stenosis right aortic regurgitation is the most common cardiac involvement in patients with ankylosing spondylitis spondylosis okay so in this patients what is the hla which is positive which hla is positive in these patients hla b which hla is positive in these patients hla b27 is positive right hla b27 will be positive in these patients so how do you treat these patients you give nsh yes that's very correct dr venkatesh hla b27 is the right answer so how do you treat these patients you give nsh you give damars mainly physiotherapy physiotherapy is what helps the patient in the long term in the long run right if you need to identify first initial stages of uh, sacroiliacus what is the uh, what is the investigation of choice mri mri can identify even early stages of sacroiliacus okay so this is some small discussion about aortic spon uh, um, ankylosing spondylitis okay it is one of the spondyloarthritis okay yes next question a 45 year old male presents to the er with arthritis fever red teary eyes he complains of cough as well there are tender nodules on his shins on examination of the eyes uveitis is seen chest x ray shows bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy which of the following will also be seen in this patient right i would like you to recap the first question because it is somewhat similar to that right arthritis fever red teary eyes i already told you rheumatology has a lot of non i mean constitutional symptoms which are very non specific arthritis fever you will see almost in all the conditions right and uveitis is also quite common so arthritis fever uveitis is there along with that he has some tender nodules in the shin also and x ray shows bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy whenever you see bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy the first thing that you that should come to your mind is sarcoidosis right this is sarcoidosis okay sarcoidosis so which of the following will also be seen in this patient is it elevated pth is it hypocalcemia elevated ac levels decreased vitamin d or hypophosphatemia what do you see in these patients is it elevated pth dr arya option 3 that's very very correct let's recap elevated ac levels are the correct answer angiotensin converting enzyme levels are elevated so in this patients they will have hypercalcemia calcium will be elevated vitamin d will also be elevated calcium will be elevated vitamin d will also be elevated if the pth is elevated what do you have you have hyper parathyroidism hyper parathyroidism right hyper parathyroidism is where you have elevated pth but in sarcoidosis you have elevated calcium and vitamin d as well as elevated ac enzyme levels right so from where is the vitamin d produced it is produced from the granuloma it is produced from the granuloma you have features of hypercalcemia in these patients right and what are these tender nodules on the shins what are they called they are erythema nodosum lesions watch which are erythema nodosum right nodes nodosum nodes erythema red red tender nodules on the shins which is erythema nodosum right okay next a 40 year old female presented in the op with painful tender joints she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and was taking methotrexate sulfa salicin and hydroxychloroquine without adequate response on examination 10 joints are swollen and tender which of the following is the next best step okay so this is a 40 year old lady who has presented with painful tender joints she also we have, they have already given you the diagnosis it is rheumatoid arthritis okay what was she already taking she is already on demands She is taking methotrexate, sulfa salicin, and hydroxychloroquine, but the response is poor. Ten joints are involved. Right? What is the next step? What is the next level of drug that you should be giving? Right? In the first step, what will you give? You will give steroids plus methotrexate 
right after that you will give demands right after that what will you give anti tnf alpha agents tnf in alpha agents then you will give another anti tnf alpha agent or rituximab if you already given one anti tnf alpha agent then you will add another anti tnf alpha agent or you will give rituximab right you will give rituximab right so for this patient you have already given methotrexate sulfasalazin and hydroxychloroquine so what should you now be adding you should be adding a tnf alpha inhibitor this has been given this has been given so you should be adding a tnf alpha inhibitor right very correct all of you have responded so beautifully so tnf alpha inhibitor so which is the which is the tnf alpha inhibitor among these drugs yes monoclonal antibody which is the tnf alpha inhibitor among this it is adalimumab it is adalimumab it is a tnf alpha agent inhibitor it is given subcutaneously okay it is given subcutaneously there is a risk of infections along with this and with all tnf alpha agents you have a risk of lupus flare okay even if the patient is not having a lupus the patient can become ana positive and can they can also have some features of lupus showing up because of a side effect of tnf alpha inhibitors Right, you must remember that this adalimumab or the infliximab, they have the side effect of producing lupus flare or they can have lupus-like symptoms being produced in the patient along with ANA positivity. Okay, so that is one extra point that we have learned today. I have told you in the class also, you can go back and listen to that. Right, so adalimumab, yes, Dr. Sendhil, it's very correct. Adalimumab is the correct answer for this question. Right, so let's revise this uh, picture once. Diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. You start the patient on methotrexate along with steroids. Then you have a combination of demands, right? You add sulfa salicin, etc. Leflunamide, all those things. If that's all, that is also not working, then you have to add a TNF alpha agent. Then if that is not working, you give the patient another TNF alpha agent along with rituximab or abatacep or tocilizumab, right? Along with this, what all should you be doing? You should be giving, you should be advising physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is very, very important in, to, in order to maintain the activity of the patient. The patient should not think that he is having pain and should restrict the movement. That is not uh, what we expect the patient. We want to give a good quality of life for the patient. That's why we're giving so many medicines, right? All these are aimed at giving a best possible quality of life for the patient, right? So you should encourage physiotherapy. You should encourage the patient to walk and do their activities on, the, on their own. And the most important thing is you should treat the patient early because you should be avoiding you should be avoiding deformities in the patient. You should be avoiding deformities in the patient. Right. So the next question. A 28-year-old female presented to the ER with migraine and lace-like purplish rash on the skin. She has a history of recurrent miscarriages. Laboratory tests reveal that she revealed that lupus anticoagulants are in high titers. Which of the following will, co will confirm that the patient is suffering from antiphospholipid syndrome? Okay. Laboratory tests reveal that lupus anticoagulants are in high titers. Lupus anticoagulants are in high titers. Right. Which of the following will confirm that the patient is having and uh, patient is having antiphospholipid syndrome? Yes. What is the answer? Option 5. Dr. Mushir Akbar says it is option 5. Any other answers? I'll read the question once again. A 28-year-old female present to the ER with migraine and lace-like purplish rash on the skin. She has a history of recurrent miscarriages. Laboratory tests reveal that lupus anticoagulants are in high titers. Which of the following will confirm the patient is having uh, uh, is suffering from antiphospholipid syndrome? What is the clinching point in this? Right? So, first of all, this lace-like purplish rash, what is it called? It is Livido reticularis, right? This is Livido reticularis. They have already given you the diagnosis. It is antiphospholipid syndrome, right? So, which of these? Evidence of stroke, evidence of DVT, elevated lupus anticoagulant is enough to est establish the diagnosis. Elevated antiphospholipid antibody after 4, 12 weeks and fetal loss before the 10th week of pregnancy. Which of the following is needed to confirm the diagnosis, right? Which of the following is needed to confirm the diagnosis, not to cons just consider the diagnosis. Which of the following is the answer, right? 
you can say that all of the features you know all the features are looking similar like some all of these fit into the diagnosis of uh, antiphospholipid syndrome you all of you are right but there is one point which will help you in confirming the diagnosis yes dr sendil also says it's 12 week i mean it's, uh, it is after the 10 before the 10th week of pregnancy the fetal loss but the answer to this question is elevated antiphospholipid antibody after 12 weeks right this is the on uh, this is the answer to this question so most of the times what happens we read all the criteria but we forgot whether it is one criteria plus how many major and how many minor criteria we might forget that or we might sometimes forget the fine points in the table right that is what happens in this question so i will show you so there are varied answers point 3 and point 4 also no so i'll tell you there is vascular thrombosis so dvt central venous thrombosis all these things can be present pregnancy morbidity death of normal fetus at 10 less than 10 weeks more than 10 weeks then premature birth at less than 34 weeks due to preeclampsia three consecutive abortions at less than 10 weeks placental insufficiency at less than 34 weeks lupus anticoagulant anti beta 2 glycoprotein and anti cardiolipid all these things are there but to confirm this what should you have you should check it at least two times 12 weeks apart yes uh, dr raghu is asking ma'am shouldn't i consider both from one clinical and one from lab yes that's what i'm telling you they have given some clinical criteria some laboratory criteria they have given both right they have given you evidence of let's go back to the question they have given you uh, there is lace like purplish rash there is history of recurrent miscarriages there is a positive point and there are also anticoagulant lupus anticoagulant in high titers right but what is the point which will help you in diagnosing it is only this evidence of stroke can be there right evidence of stroke can also be there evidence of dvt can be there all these things can be there but what will come is these lupus anticoagulants or all these anti phospholipid antibody should be positive even after 12 weeks that is the most important point it should be present it should be positive even after 12 weeks that is the most diagnostic point in this right so the clinical criteria and lab criteria both should be taken into consideration but these all these antibody titers should be present in medium to high titers in the question they have mentioned high titers and the most important question most important point is even after 12 weeks these should be positive that is when you make the diagnosis of anti phospholipid antibody syndrome right yes so i hope you won't forget this uh, point forever okay that's the point of including this question in this uh, discussion okay so again we are able to revise all the clinical criteria and the lab criteria at the same time and this very point is very very important so whenever you read a table you must also remember to read the fine points okay so that you are you don't forget the actual points usually what they do is they, they give the minor and major criteria in bold letters so we tend to forget how many major how many minor criteria we forget all those things right we only remember the criteria okay so in this point you need to remember that clinical criteria are important lab criteria are also important and they must be checked at least two times 12 weeks apart to find the diagnosis okay yes thank you so much for the active participation it's very encouraging okay next one a 40 year old female presented to the er with hemoptysis and nasal crusting she also complained of decreased hearing from the last two months chest x ray shows there are pleural nodules and infiltrates with cavitation urine examination reveals dysmorphic rbc which of the following is the best test for this disease okay is it cnk is it pnk rheumatoid factor tuberculin test or blood cultures okay so what is the answer what is the answer for this patient so the patient is having hemoptysis and nasal crusting so you have an lrti involvement and a uri involvement urda involvement right she also complains of decreased hearing decreased hearing is also there chest x ray shows pleural nodules and infiltrates with cavitation cavitating nodules cavitating nodules urine examination reveals dysmorphic rbcs that means renal involvement is there right renal involvement is there so i have written down the points for you so granulomatosis with polyangiitis 
option a okay let's look at the answers dr ago and dr uh, sabari charan yeah so can you tell me why it is option 1 can any of you tell me yeah it is vaginus or gpa granulomatosis polyangiitis like i keep stressing on the important points you have lrti involvement urt involvement cavitating nodules and renal involvement all these four indicate that the patient is having granulomatosis polyangiitis or vaginus in these patients c and k will be positive right in these patients c and k will be positive so that's the best test for this patient so what is c and k what is it against it is against proteinase 3 right it is against proteinase 3 anti pr3 antibody anti pr3 antibody okay so this is again a revision you have seen all these things right rheumatoid factor is seen in rheumatoid arthritis blood cultures you know for infection infective components p and k can be seen in other uh, egpa also right and tuberculin test tuberculin test is seen in tuberculosis right so this is quite simple when you know you are able to identify the disease based on these key points okay and one more thing i had told you c and k the uh, st uh, starting antigen will be starting with p right protein s3 does not mpo okay yes so let's move on to the next uh, thing what are the characteristic features of scleroderma renal crisis what is scleroderma renal crisis and what are the characteristic features so we have not touched upon scleroderma so that's why i thought it would be a good idea to discuss it in brief here so what happens in scleroderma we all know that there is thickening of the skin right let us uh, see from first few points that we already know right scleroderma there is thickening of the skin thickening of the skin right thickening of the skin will be there along with that what will happen there is induration and thickening so what is it classified into what is it classified into you have scleroderma so what is it classified into you have diffuse cutaneous scleroderma and localized diffuse and localized scleroderma localized cutaneous scleroderma okay so diffuse and localized so in this what happens this diffuse is often mild but this is localized is very severe and there is critical limb ischemia critical limb ischemia critical limb ischemia critical limb ischemia is there in these patients so this is mild this is diffuse and this is mild localized severe critical limb ischemia is there okay so one more thing what is the most important symptom among these patients these patients will have raynaud's phenomenon raynaud's phenomenon they have raynaud's phenomenon so what is raynaud's phenomenon you have pallor plus cyanosis plus redness on rewarming right what is raynaud's phenomenon you have pallor you have cyanosis you have redness on rewarming all these three things will be there raynaud's phenomenon will have pallor cyanosis and redness on rewarming they will also have pain and tightness of the fingers you will also have pain and tightness of the fingers pain and tightness of the fingers right you will have pain and tightness tightness of the fingers okay so when we come to limited cutaneous what is the you have one syndrome which is called crest crest syndrome crest syndrome right what is it it is calcinosis cutis what is the crest syndrome you have calcinosis cutis right calcinosis cutis then you have r is for raynaud syndrome r is for raynaud syndrome right calcinosis cutis raynaud syndrome e is for esophagitis e is for esophagitis e is for esophagitis then s is for what is s it is sclerodactyly sclerodactyly then what is t you have t lingectasia okay so crest syndrome is you have calcinosis cutis 
Raynaud syndrome, esophagitis, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. In scleroderma, unit remember, there are two types, diffuse and localized. So diffuse will be mild, whereas uh, localized will be severe. There is also critical limb ischemia in those patients. So what is the most common uh, most common syndrome in these patients? They will have Raynaud's phenomenon. What is Raynaud's phenomenon? When you when the when the patient is exposed to cold atmosphere, the patient will have pallor and cyanosis, and the patient the fingers will become very red on rewarming, and there will also be pain and tightness of the fingers when they are exposed to cold. Okay, so this is what is Raynaud's phenomenon. There is something called crest, which is calcinosis cutis, Raynaud syndrome, Raynaud's phenomenon rather than esophagitis, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. Okay, all these three things are there. So let's talk something about diffuse. Right. Let's talk about diffuse scleroderma. In this, what is positive? Anti-SCL70. This antibody is positive in these patients. Anti-SCL70 antibody is positive in these patients. It is also called anti-topoisomerase antibody. Topoisomerase antibody is positive in these patients. Anti-topoisomerase antibody is positive in these patients. What are the features in these patients? They will have lung involvement, which is in the form of ILD, which is in the form of ILD. In cardiac involvement, they have restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy. Cardiac involvement, they will have restrictive cardiomyopathy. And renal involvement. Renal involvement, they have TMA, which is thrombotic microangiopathy, which is HUS and TTP. Okay. So diffuse scleroderma, they will have anti-SCL70 positivity, anti-topoisomerase antibody positivity, lung, will, lung involvement, they will have ILD, cardiac involvement, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and renal involvement, they will have TMA. Right. So, what is what we were discussing about scleroderma renal crisis? What is that? How do you diagnose scleroderma renal crisis? When the patient is having a new onset, new onset BP of more than 150 by 85 millimeters mercury, New onset BP of more than 85, 150 by 85 millimeters mercury, or there is more than 20 millimeter mercury increase than usual, and they have an AKI. They have an AKI. In patients with scleroderma, if they have a new onset of BP, which is more than 150 by 85 millimeters mercury, or the BP increase is more than 12 millimeters mercury from their baseline, and when the patient is having an acute kidney injury, you call this as scleroderma renal crisis this is a renal crisis okay this is called a renal crisis in these patients so how do you support the scleroderma renal crisis in these patients the patient will have maha what is maha microangiopathic hemolytic anemia these patients will have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and they will also have accelerated hypertension findings in their eyes like papal edema they can also have accelerated hi hypertension findings in their eyes like papal edema. Okay, so new onset BP more than 150 by 85 millimeters mercury, the BP increase of more than 20 millimeters mercury from the baseline and an acute kidney injury. Right, In these patients, what do they have? They will also have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and papal edema. So coming back to the, what we were discussing, I was asking what are the characteristic features of scleroderma renal crisis? So what are the characteristic features? New onset BP more than 150, 85 then uh, AKI or BP of a BP increase of more than 20 millimeters mercury from the baseline. So I told you what are the important points that you need to remember in scleroderma. Diffuse, localized. Localized is most severe. Crest, what is crest? Calcinosis cutis, Raynaud's phenomenon. Esophagitis, sclerodactyly and telangiectasia. Raynaud's phenomenon is very, very important. That happens when it is exposed to cold. When you have any, when it is exposed to cold atmosphere or cold water or cold, you know, even in the AC, the patients and I will have pallor and cyanosis followed by redness on rewarming. There will also be severe pain and tightness of the fingers. They will have thickening of the skin and induration of the skin. Okay, so this is what we have discussed in this uh, scleroderma. Okay, so once again, uh, you know, just to revise, what are the ANA patterns, diffuse pattern, nucleolar pattern, centromeric pattern, all these things we have discussed. Let's just revise that once. Right, what are the patterns? If it is homogeneous or diffuse, what are the associated antibodies? It is anti DS DNA or anti histone antibodies. Anti histone antibodies are seen in drug induced lupus, right? Drug induced lupus. Sorry, it's not DLE, it is drug induced lupus. Drug induced lupus. Anti DS DNA is seen in SLE, right? 
speckled or granular appearance, anti-RNP antibody, anti-Smith antibody, anti-SSA or anti-SSB antibody, anti-SCL70, like I told you, sclerodama and anti-Jovan antibodies. All these have a speckled or granular appearance. Okay. Next is nucleolar pattern. Nucleolar pattern is again seen in anti-SCL70, which is seen in sclerodama, anti-RNP, anti-RNA polymerase, three antibodies. Then centromere, anti-centromeric antibody, which is mainly seen in primary biliary cirrhosis. Okay. It is important for you to know these fine points so that you can score really well in your MCQs. Right? Yes. Okay. So, false among the criteria for relapsing polychondritis is among the two options, which is the false criteria. Major criteria includes proven inflammatory episodes of fever, nose cartilage or laryngotracheal cartilage. Minor criteria includes RA, RA positive inflammatory arthritis, eye inflammation, hearing loss or vestibular dysfunction. What is the correct option among this? I mean, which is false among this criteria for relapsing polychondritis? You need to remember what is polychondritis, inflammation of the cartilage. What is relapsing? It keeps happening again and again. So, multiple inflammatory episodes are happening. Okay. So, among these two options, which do you think is false? The major criteria includes proven inflammatory episodes of ear, nose cartilage or laryngotracheal cartilage. That seems correct. Okay. Minor, cart minor criteria includes RA positive inflammatory arthritis, eye inflammation, hearing loss and vestibular dysfunction. Okay. Can any of you attempt? Which could be the correct answer among, which could be the false among this criteria for relapsing polychondritis? Right? Can any of you try it? I'll just give you two minutes so that all of you can try to attempt. Dr. Raghu says A. Can you try, can you tell me why it is A? Why do you think it is A? Option A. Okay, let me tell you. So basically, relapsing polychondritis has two uh, major criteria and minor criteria. Okay, it has major criteria and minor criteria. So this option is actually correct. Option A is actually correct. Major criteria includes proven inflammatory episodes of the ear, nose cartilage or the laryngotracheal cartilage. This option is correct. The minor criteria includes, minor criteria includes eye inflammation, hearing loss and vestibular dysfunction, but it is not RA positive inflammatory arthritis. It is zero negative arthritis. Right, is it? It is zero negative arthritis. Zero negative arthritis. Okay. Yes. So the option is, it's option B is the correct answer. Minor criteria includes zero negative arthritis and not RA positive arthritis. So what are the major criteria for relapsing polychondritis? It is Proven inflammatory episodes of the ear, proven inflammatory episodes of the nose cartilage, or proven inflammatory episodes of the laryngotracheal cartilage. Three are there. In the minor criteria, you have zero negative arthritis, eye inflammation, hearing loss, and vestibular dysfunction. You have four in the minor criteria. So, how do we diagnose this? Either it's two major or one major plus two minor. Okay, one major, two major criteria, or one major plus two minor criteria. Okay, so that is what you diagnose relapsing polychondritis with. I hope this discussion is useful for all of you. Right? Yes. So let's again uh, revise Lofgren syndrome. Lofgren syndrome is seen in sarcoidosis. You have acute arthritis. You have arthritis. Right? What else do you have? Erythema nodosum plus bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. This is just to recap so that it is, you know, reiterating in your mind again and again. Okay. With or without uveitis. That is with or without uveitis. Lupus pernio, chronic sarcoid skin lesions, which are violaceous. Violaceous chronic lesions. Chronic sarcoid lesions. Hereford syndrome, it is uveoparotid fever. Uveoparotid fever. You have uveitis and parotitis. Uveoparotitis, uh, parotid with 7th cranial nerve palsy. Okay. Uveitis parotitis with 7th cranial nerve palsy. Uveo parotid fever. That's what it's already called. It's also called uveo parotid fever. Correct. Correct. Chronic erythema nodosum. That's right, uh, Dr. Kartika. That's right. Okay. Yes. Next, let's move on. 
I just wanted to, the questions are done, but I just wanted to add this point about IgG4 related disease. It's a small discussion again, just I want to highlight it because it's, uh, you know, we are diagnosing it more often nowadays and I would like all of you to be aware of this disease so that you, are, you always approach a patient with rheumatoid problem with an open mind because there are, uh, almost the symptoms are quite overlapping, but there are a lot of differences in the management. Also, and how the prognosis, you prognosticate the patient is very important to, you know, have a proof for diagnosis before you proceed on to treating the patient. Okay. IgG4 is one very, very important and uh, examiners are very fond of asking it in the MCQs. So, I just wanted to have a small discussion about IgG4 related disease. Okay. So, IgG4 related disease, you see it more commonly among males than females. Right? Because epidemiology, it is more common among the males than the females. And the peak age is around 60 to 70 years. The peak age is around 60 to 70 years. However, you can see it in any of the age groups. Recently, uh, we had also worked up a patient and uh, she is doing MBBS in another college. So, she is around that age. She is around 21, I think. So, in that age group also, you can have IgG4 related disease. Okay. So, this is very, very important. So, what do you think are the components of these patient? Components of this uh, condition. Okay. Basically, earlier there were different, different uh, components of this, which were, you know, treated separately. But later they have come to realize that all of this fall into one system, one, you know, one set of uh, like a syndromic presentation. Okay. So, there are many, many components. I'll just tell you, you can just, uh, uh, you know, try to remember all this. So, it is type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis. Okay. Type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis. Right. Next one will be retroperitoneal fibrosis. I'm sure all of you would have studied this in surgery. Retroperitoneal fibrosis. Right. Medialization of the ureter. Retroperitoneal fibrosis that is seen in IgG4 related disease. They will have lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy. Right. Lymphadenopathy. Then submandibular sialadenitis. There will be a stone in the an inflammation in the submandibular uh, duct. Submandibular. Sialadenitis, okay, sialadenitis, then orbital lesions, orbital or periorbital lesions. You can have orbital or periorbital lesions. You can have renal involvement, okay, renal involvement, right? Next, what can you have? You can have primary sclerosing cholangitis. You can also have primary sclerosing cholangitis. All these things and some more are included under IgG4 related disease. Type 1 recurrent autoimmune pancreatitis, retroperitoneal fibrosis, lymphadenopathy, submandibular sialadenitis, orbital or periorbital lesions, renal involvement, primary sclerosing cholangitis. When one or two of these are, you know, coming together as a presentation, you should definitely keep your mind open about this IgG4 related disease. Right. In this type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis, there is one classical CT presentation, which is sausage shaped pancreas. Sausage shaped pancreas. Yes, readers also. So, there is some inflammation everywhere. All of these you should correlate and try to, you know, see whether the IgG4 related disease is what uh, is there in this patient. So, pancreatitis is very, very common. Retroperitoneal fibrosis, you know, you, you rarely see in these patients. But you need to keep all of these in mind. So, whenever you have a diagnosis of retroperitoneal fibrosis, you should go back and see whether the patient can have an IgG4 related disease also. Okay. So, in this, there are a few more points that you need to remember. So, I'll just tell you the salient features. There is something called storiform fibrosis. This can be asked in your quiz exam. What is the histological pattern? It is called storiform fibrosis, right? In histology, it is called storiform fibrosis. What is it? It is a swirling pattern or a cartwheel pattern, right? A swirling pattern or a cartwheel pattern. This is called storiform fibrosis, swirling pattern or a cartwheel pattern on histology. This is seen on histology, right? When you biopsy and you can take a sample, then you will see storiform fibrosis in these patients. And they will also have a lot of lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate. They will have lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate. These are plasma cells which contain plasma cells which contain IgG4. Right? These are plasma cells which contain IgG4. So there will be a lot of plasma cell infiltrates which contain IgG4 and they will have a storiform fibrosis or a cartwheel appearance. Cartwheel appearance will be there. Okay. So, as the topic says, IgG4 levels will be elevated. Okay. IgG4 levels will be elevated. Sometimes they can be normal. In those conditions, what you should do, 
you should do a ratio of IgG4 by IgG. That time you will show an elevation. That's when you diagnose the patient is having IgG4 related disease. So IgG4 is most commonly elevated, but sometimes it can be normal when you should do this um, thing. Okay. So how do you treat the patients? Like most other rheumatological uh, problems, you treat the patient first with steroids. Right? First with steroids. These are the first line. And this disease responds very well to steroids. But you need to keep in mind the uh, duration of steroids because it is quite, you know, this uh, patients remit quite easily. Okay. So steroids are the first line drugs. If they are relapsing, then what do you need, what do you need to give the patient? You need to give rituximab. Rituximab. Okay. So first line is steroids. And this, uh, you know, when the patient is relapsing, you, you give rituximab. So let us just recap it. IgG4 related disease. It is peaking in the age of 60 to 70 years. It's more common among males. And there is a huge list of, uh, you know, components of this IgG4 related disease. But all these can be there in combination with one or two or just even one can be presenting or a recurrent type of autoimmune pancreatitis can be there. Okay. So all these things, you should go back and see whether the patient is having an increased IgG4 level. So IgG4 level will be increased. The first line of treatment in these patients is steroid. And if they are relapsing, then you give the patient rituximab. Okay. So that brings us to the end of this uh, rheumatology chapter. I thank you all so much for joining in and participating so actively in the discussion today. It's really very encouraging and I'm very happy. So we'll, discuss, we'll come up with the next uh, medicine topic. I'll just keep you updated about it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was really a wonderful session uh, and a quick uh, rapid revision like for us. And uh, mm -hmm. if you have any doubt, you can just post it in the comments or you can just put it in our group or you can also post in the chat box now, which will be uh, clarified by ma'am. And uh, we will have uh, future classes will be updated in the group. So if you haven't joined yet, I'll just put the group link in the comments uh, so that you can just join it. And uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for once again joining with us. With Now we have completed cardiology and rheumatology completely. And we are uh, awaiting for uh, next uh, rapid discussion uh, wonderful session ma'am thank you thank you so much thank you dr sabri charan and kartika and mushir thank you so much thank you